Welcome back to the show. Joining me this week is Steph Pomboy. She's a fantastic macro analyst and the founder and president, I think, of Macro Mavens. Is that correct? Yes, oh, chief cook and bottle washer or whatever you want to call me. <laughs> so tell us a little bit, first of all, about your career background, because I find it to be fascinating. You've done so much. Um, Macro Mavens has been around since 2002, right? And it's very data driven, very focused on research and market analysis. So tell us your backstory. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, first off, thanks so much for having me, Natalie. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, you know, I did, I'm, I've been in the business for a long time, longer than I care to confess, but, um, you know, I studied economics in college and I was trying to figure out what to do for a summer job and managed to land an internship working for Ed Hyman, who at the time, and probably still to this day, was rated the number one economist on Wall Street by institutional investor. I mean, I think he's had that title for four decades now. Um, so I was lucky I got an internship with him. And then when I was getting ready to graduate, he asked me if I'd come work with him full time. So I had it real easy. I got uh, to, you know, basically sit at his elbow and watch him analyze the economy and then meet with institutional investors. And that's where I thought the magic really happened was how investors took the economic forecasts that Ed was proffering and converted them into actionable investment ideas. Mm -hmm. Like who cares whether GDP is 2.3 or 2.5, but somehow they were able to make a trade based on whether it was higher or lower than expected. So I thought that was fascinating. And after 12 years working with Ed, I set up Macro Mavens with the idea of basically connecting the dots between the broad economic trends and what they mean and where the opportunities lie in the markets. Um, which, you know, generally most Wall Street economists don't connect those dots. They forecast the data, but they don't then make the step to what the broad macro investment implications are. So I started that, as you mentioned, in 2002 and have kind of built a reputation for better or for worse of being extremely contrarian. Um, <laughs> And that's not an accident because my general approach every day when I sit down in front of my Bloomberg terminal and look at the data and then watch how the markets respond to it is to figure out what the markets might be missing. Uh, for example, you know, we saw that last week, the last two weeks, the unemployment claims came in a little weaker and everyone thought, OK, well, now we're clearly headed for the soft landing. Goldilocks is back on. So buy risk assets. So, you know, I have ways to pick into that and figure out whether that's the right conclusion to draw or not. And uh, that's basically what I do on a daily basis. Well, I love to host contrarians because as Bitcoiners, we are contrarians to the uh, to the financial system as well. Um, yeah. So tell me a little bit about your macro outlook right now, because one thing that I know is that you saw the, the housing bubble before it popped and you were warning people. And then we ushered in this era of QE, which yeah. was actually coming to a point of extreme weakening before the pandemic. And then we just blazed in with the money bazooka and, uh, and we liquefied everything. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's taken so long for things to sort yeah. of, I don't know, um, work their way out of the system for us to have a deflation. Some people were calling for a deflationary bust, but we've been able to kick the can down the road. And some yeah. people thought we had this soft landing, but now things I think are starting to change. You have said on shows that you think we've already entered recession. So talk to me about your outlook right now. Well, I like to keep it simple. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the math is, uh, you know, inexorable. Uh, when you have an economy that's highly levered and you raise interest rates dramatically, um, odds are you're probably going to have some repercussions from that. Um, and you're right that this unique combination of not just the aggressive monetary stimulus, but in uh, combination with uh, fiscal stimulus, which was literally that Ben Bernanke helicopter money, where we printed the money and literally sent checks to people's mailbox, uh, and that enabled them to sustain um, their consumption. Um, that whole game does appear to have ended. You know, the fiscal impulse is clearly gone when you look at that whole thesis, the notion that I thought was kind of laughable of excess savings that people were yeah, talking yeah. about. Um, yeah. So to the extent that that was out there, it's completely, not only has that gone, 
but consumers have had to run up credit card debt, as you know, uh, in record fashion. They went from paying down credit card debt during the uh, COVID stimulus spectacular um, to ramping it up and did that in the face of 23% interest rates. I mean, I don't think anyone does that voluntarily. So that was a clear warning sign to me that consumers, at least at the lower end of the chain, were really starting to feel the pinch. Um, and that's largely been ignored by Wall Street because, you know, they don't share those problems. The average guy who's running a fund isn't, you know, uh, paying 23 percent on credit cards because he has no choice uh, but to borrow on his credit card to put food on the table and, and uh, fill his gas tank. And he's going to dinner in Manhattan at restaurants that you can't get a reservation in and they're charging two hundred dollars a plate. Um, so to them. This notion that the rest of the world, you know, the rest of the economy was really struggling was, you know, completely off the radar. Um, but we've seen that obviously start to catch up in terms of the surge in credit card delinquency rates um, and the slowdown in discretionary spending. But, you know, just stepping back again, my operating thesis is we have an economy that relies on credit to move forward. And that's mm -hmm. largely a function. Um, as your audience will be very familiar with the Federal Reserve's history of overstaying accommodation, inflating massive bubbles, and then when mm -hmm. those bubbles invariably burst, rushing back in with the fire hoses and pumping even more money in um, and to kind of numb the pain of the prior bubble bust. Um, and the process has led us to become an economy that totally relies on credit to grow. And not only does it rely on credit to grow, but because we've been at this for so many decades, we have passed the point of diminishing marginal returns. So we don't just require credit to grow. We require ever increasing amounts mm -hmm. of credit to go the same GDP mile. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, it's basic math, like I said, and, um, and yet it seems to be ignored in the Goldilocks scenario excitement um, to buy risk assets as if, you know, we can print all this money and somehow they'll never pay the piper um, and the game will just keep going without consequence. And I, I think you're, as I mentioned, with the credit card delinquencies, you know, highest corporate bankruptcies since 2017, you're clearly seeing signs that we've re reached the end of the runway here. Coin Stories is proudly brought to you by BitDare, a global leader in disruptive technology for Bitcoin mining and AI. As a publicly traded leader, BitDare boasts a massive 900 megawatts of operational data center capacity and an additional 1.1 gigawatts under development across three continents, positioning BitDare as one of the most diversified and power-dense computing companies in the world. BitDeer's leadership laid the groundwork for the original advancements in Bitcoin mining ASICs. It's really the only company in the industry with the track record and clout to disrupt the market again with groundbreaking new designs for the next generation of mining ASICs. Now, BitDeer is leveraging years of expertise in data center and cloud management into high-performance computing through a recently announced partnership with NVIDIA. Join BitDeer in reshaping the world of Bitcoin mining. Learn more at BitDeer.com and explore how they are pioneering the future today. Well, there's a saying that many of my viewers might be familiar with, which is that the Fed has basically outlawed recessions because to your point, <laughs> whenever something happens, they rush in with the fire hose. So um, are you basically saying that at some point, possibly in the very near future, that it will be different because they won't be able to? So when they usher in that next round of QE because things are weakening and we might be showing signs of deflation, they won't be able to sort of rescue with the money printer? Well, I think um, they will certainly try because that's the standard formula, you know? Um, and the problem is that they will have to do uh, even larger amount of QE than they've had to do. Each iteration requires more and more QE, as I said, you mean, because we passed diminishing marginal returns. Um, but also this economy is so, the financial markets are so incredibly levered and we really have no way to know exactly how much, but you have so much silent leverage, whether it's tied to the yen carry trade or just the leverage structures. And, and it's all increasingly opaque when you get into things like private credit, where there's really no regulation. Mm -hmm. It's like the wild west and no one's tracking the size of this market and the quality, et cetera. Um, so we won't know 
um, till after it goes bust, just how big and how much leverage is underlying it. But what I think is going to happen, and, and this is where I differ from the consensus, is I've long uh, pushed back on this, I, this sort of fanciful idea that the Fed was going to start cutting rates before the recession was obviously in train or before the market started to go down. Um, they've never managed to pull that off before. Um, so it struck me as kind of um, a Herculean bet to, to, to bet that they were going to do it this time. Um, plus, they have this, they really have this additional problem that while the inflation numbers have come down, the rate of inflation has come down, still above their target. And when you look at the two key components that drive inflation, which are energy and home prices, shelter, um, they've stopped going down and are going up. So it strikes me that the easy um, progress has been made and that it's going to be very hard to get those inflation numbers lower. Um, so they kind of either have to say, all right, we're fine with two and a half, 2.8, 3% inflation. We're gonna focus more on the employment side, which is one thing, um, but they have that issue that kind of at a minimum is gonna live, uh, limit how aggressive they can be in terms of rate cuts. So yes, maybe we get the September rate cut of 25 basis points, but the markets are pricing in, I don't, you know, last time I checked, like 150 basis points over the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't see a scenario where inflation comes down enough for them to do that unless the markets completely fall apart and the economy goes into recession, et cetera. In which case, you're not going to be want to be invested in all the risk assets that everyone's flying into in anticipation of this rate cut. So yeah, that's my my main issue with that thesis. Have you been surprised by how resilient the markets have been in the face of these rate hikes, or are you just attributing that to the fiscal dominance side and the fiscal spigots being so wide open? Well, I think it's two things. I think you're right to attribute a fair amount to the fiscal side, or at least initially, let's say in the first 12 months of the tightening cycle, that that really helped numb a lot of the, the pain of the interest rate hikes, although eventually barring a decline in interest rates, the, the bill was still going to come due. You know, if you were a junk rated borrower whose cost of borrowing was 4% and it went to 8 and you were still getting, you know, ERC credits or whatever with which you could service 8% debt, that was great until those credits ran out. Now you're still looking at 8% and trying to figure out how you're going to service that in an environment where earnings growth seems to be decelerating. Um, but uh, I think one thing that really stunned me is the willingness to just bet on the pivot. So it felt like almost for the last year, year and a half, the markets have looked through the high level of interest rates to the pivot on the other side. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you've seen this in terms of the behavior where you know, my real focus was on the corporate credit market, because in contrast to the housing bubble bust, which was really a consumer housing related affair, this time the excesses are on the corporate balance sheets. Um, and you've seen a huge degradation of corporate balance sheets, which no one really seems to recognize or appreciate. Um, but, you know, when more than half of what's considered investment grade is actually just a downgrade away from being junk. Um, and that's using fairly generous uh, definitions of, you know, what their capital situation is. Um, you have a very vulnerable corporate credit market and you ratcheted up rates. And what's interesting to me was to watch the willingness of creditors to play these games like extend and pretend or, you know, yeah. uh, re restructuring. I think Bloomberg had some story about how 80% of the um, defaults were basically, you know, restructured debts. Mm -hmm. So they aren't, no one's actually letting the companies go bankrupt. They're figuring yeah. out ways to work around. Um, and presumably they're doing that because everyone's anticipating that a few months from now rates are going to be lower. So why, you know, why risk the company going out of business and paying you nothing when you can cut a little bit what you're um, getting from them in terms of interest income just to keep them alive and rates are going to be lower, you know, in, in time anyway. So everyone was willing to put all those, their eggs in that pivot basket. 
in anticipation that not only was the Fed going to pivot forthwith, but that when they did, it would be material. And I, as I had mentioned earlier, had issues with both sides of that, both that they would rush to pivot before anything really, any crisis happened. And second, that they would have the wiggle room to cut rates enough for it to have a material impact. Well, you're totally right. I mean, there's this false sense of safety. Everyone is accustomed to the Fed coming to the rescue because that's what they've done. So the drug addict knows that the drug dealer will be there to provide them with a hit once it's really, really necessary and the withdrawals become too too much. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's funny. I Have you ever seen Game of Thrones? No, I haven't. Uh, it's, I'm probably the I mean, only one who hasn't watched it. It's like a total, you know, supernatural medieval show that's completely fiction, but it has some parallels that are crazy. And there's this episode I was watching last night where one of the characters becomes the master of coin. Essentially, he he presides over the the budgets and the balance sheets, and um, he gets advice from the previous one that says that once you realize that they're just numbers on a sheet of paper you can easily make them behave. And I just think that that is so true because at the end of the day, we're just dealing with electronic ledgers that the central bank can come in and manipulate and reliquify and all of that capital goes to the banks and then obviously asset holders get richer and richer. So I kind of wanted to ask you about that because when we zoom out, this has had really dire consequences on American citizens, the middle class, the working class, and people are getting so frustrated. They're turning to politics for solutions. We're Mm -hmm. seeing an increase in populism. Can you talk about sort of the effects of these policies on America and why we're getting to a place of such polarization and frustration? Yeah, no, it's such a good point. And it's the thing that really frustrates me is that having sat through and watched, you know, several decades of this cycle where the Fed inflates these bubbles enriches Wall Street. And then when they burst, um, you know, the consequences are paid for by Main Street in -hmm. terms of diminished purchasing power because of the debasement of the dollar with all these serial uh, quantitative easing cycles. So it's something that I've been focused on a lot. And and one of the topics, and it makes people's eyes glaze over when I say it, um, that has me really worried is the pension situation because not only are people struggling just with their real incomes right now, which are not keeping up with the rising cost of living, et cetera, um, but they're assuming that the pensions that their employers um, or the state that they work for have promised them are gonna be there and in whole at what the day comes that they retire. Um, And when you look at who's been the most aggressive risk takers over the last several years of, the before the Fed raised rates, we had that long period of financial repression where they held interest rates so low. Um, If you were running a pension fund with an 8% annual return mandate, and there was no 8% yield anywhere on the planet, you had no choice but to get into the riskiest assets Mm -hmm. and not just get into the riskiest assets, but then layer on leverage. And you've seen any number of stories, CalPERS, et cetera, talking about how they were going to increase leverage. Obviously, they've plowed into alternative assets, Mm -hmm. which apparently is some separate universe in which 8% returns grow on trees with no risk. So (laughs) um, I suspect we'll find out that isn't exactly how it plays out. Um, But those are highly illiquid securities. So they're in things like venture capital and private equity and Mm -hmm. private credit. And if and when the shoe drops and we have this credit bus that's been building thanks to all the leverage and the ramp up in interest rates courtesy of the Federal Reserve, um, they're not going to be able to liquidate these positions. Yeah. And so they're going to have to sell everything else. So GE, Walmart, Microsoft, yeah. all the really blue chip companies that shouldn't get thrown out with the bathwater are going to get brutalized because the pensions have nothing else that they can sell to raise money. Um, to pay out retirees who are knocking on the door every day since we're an aging population. It's not like we can kick the can down the road. Every day, more people are coming to collect their retirement. So that's what I worry about a lot, you know, away from what we're already seeing, which is, you know, the last couple of years have been really eye-opening in terms of the tax that inflation has on the average American. And when 
politicians go around and say, yeah, but look at the numbers. Inflation's gone from nine to two. We're heroes. Yeah. Um, that's really offensive to the average American who only knows that the price of bacon and eggs and gasoline that went up a lot is going up at a slightly slower rate, but is still way beyond their capacity to afford anymore. Well, and haven't you seen um, how the po political leaders will blame greedy corporations for things like grocery price increases? But then when you look at the data, when you look at the numbers, it's they're they are operating on razor thin profit right. margins. And basically prices have just increased tracking the rate of the monetary inflation, the monetary base that's increased. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's just an example of I, I don't know if it's that they're ignorant about how the system works, how businesses actually operate, yes. yeah. um, or if they're just playing dumb because they think it sounds politically mm -hmm. um, you know, smart to say, oh, it's those greedy right. corporations, right. let's blame them, rather than taking responsibility themselves for being just reckless in terms of the fiscal and monetary policy. Um, but yeah, I, I think I people, hopefully, the average American is smart enough to know because, you know, a lot of people have their own businesses and they exactly. know full well that they're not gouging, they're struggling, you know, yeah. to keep yeah. their employees paid, et cetera. Well, that's a great point. I was going to say, I mean, if you own a small business, you own a corporation. So they're, you know, they're pledging to increase corporate taxes. That means the restaurant that you go to, you know, the small mom and pop shop, those are corporations as well. And they're the ones that really need help right now and a relief when it comes to things like taxes. And I wanted to ask you, because there's almost something perverse about Main Street actually advocating or, or wanting these policies that are contributing to the rich getting richer, um, because they do see that okay, well, if the money printer goes burr or if some of these policies right. are in place, my 401k goes up, my house value goes up. But can you talk a little bit about how much nuance there is um, within that, that that actually doesn't contribute to enriching the middle class? It only benefits the people at the top? Absolutely. No, there's a huge skew, as everyone is, is aware, between the high-end consumer and the low-end. And frankly, you know, as an economist, I have to sit here and look at these average statistics. What was consumer spending for the month? What were retail sales? And they reflect sort of the average across the yeah. economy. Um, but increasingly, that average doesn't reflect anybody. You have two consumers. You've got the high end that's bulletproof and the low end that's seriously struggling and running up credit card debt um, and drawing down whatever little saving they had just to sustain the same lifestyle. Um, so I think it's really. I, this is where people start to get really dark about the risks of some kind of civil unrest where the haves versus the have nots uh, become so extreme that finally, you know, the average guy in the street says, this is ridiculous. I can't continue to abide this kind of, um, you know, policy that's basically screwing me over at the expense of um, the very high end consumer. Um, so I think that's an issue. And, you know, um, getting back to your point about the small businesses, which are really the backbone of the US economy, yeah. that um, stat that I mentioned earlier about the largest number of corporate bankruptcy filings since 2017, these aren't obviously the big companies. These right. aren't S&P 500 companies that are going bankrupt. It's all the mid and small size companies that had no, they didn't have the luxury of borrowing in the capital markets. So right. when their, you know, interest rates went up, they had to pay those higher rates. No one was working around their debts. They had to suck it up and they had to suck it up at the same time. All their input costs were going through the roof, whether it was, you know, food yep. or uh, for restaurant industry to say nothing of labor, which went up. Um, so it really, they got squeezed left, right, and center, and not surprisingly, have been going bankrupt in near record fashion. Um, so I, the, the question then is, um, what happens in terms of the employment shoe on that yeah. score? Because they're also huge drivers of employment. Uh, and that's where, you know, we could get really deep in the weeds on the, um, the statistics about employment and whether they have any bearing in reality. Um, and I think we're going to find out on Thursday when the BLS makes with its benchmark revision to payroll employment that um, their monthly payroll numbers really had very little bearing in reality. But that's a sidetrack. Sorry. 
Well, no, it's, it's true. I mean, no one knows what to believe because these payroll numbers are constantly getting revised and really they're yeah. adding the most amount of jobs in the public sector. The government is taking yes. the, you know, these people on and, and paying their salaries. Um, so is, is it true that you're forecasting potentially a, a rise to five, six percent unemployment and the Fed having to rush in? Yeah. And, and again, I'm not this isn't a, a heroic forecast. Anytime the unemployment rate starts to move, when it moves up half a percentage point, it then on average goes up another 2.9 percentage points. Yeah. That's excluding COVID. I didn't even include the COVID experience mm -hmm. when we went up to 20% or whatever unemployment. Um, but just in a normal, typical recession, you go up 2.9 or any cycle. Mm -hmm. um, so I, it doesn't turn, the point is the unemployment rate, when it turns, turns dramatically and quickly. These, you know, if you are familiar with the chart of the unemployment rate, it's not some gentle rolling hills, hills you know, it looks up, down, up, down, you know, like an EKG. Yeah. Um, so we could be, you know, we could easily be at 5% by the end of the year. I don't think that would be totally surprising. Um, and we should be north of six by the end of next year, given history. Well, we've identified the problem and symptoms of the problem. So what are the solutions? Because I know one thing that you talk about a lot is hard money. You're invested in gold. So what is the solution to all the problems we just talked about? Well, the number one solution, and I'm going to date myself, would be to embrace the Ron Paul philosophy <laughs> and do away with the Federal Reserve, which has, since the day it was started, inflicted more harm than good on the U.S. economy. Um, so that would be my first solution. Let's let's get rid of the Federal Reserve. It's never going to happen. But if if I were princess or queen for the day, that's what I would do. Um, I love it. Uh, but yeah, so I end up coming back to gold because I don't believe anyone's going to do away with the Fed or even limit their capacity to operate. Um, because, you know, in D.C., everyone loves this whole arrangement whereby they can spend all the money they want and the Federal Reserve will print bills with which to finance it. So what's the problem? And the average American can pay the, the bill for it. Um, so I, you know, I like hard assets. Um, and I guess I'm hoping upon hope that this time we actually get through an entire cycle where the economy is able to cleanse the excesses uh, that have been built up over the last two decades, basically, um, that'll be brutal, but it would be really healthy in terms of setting us on a track of a sustainable um, economic model moving forward. Um, but I, you know, again, I like to dwell in the world of reality rather than fantasy. So that's why, you know, most of my portfolio is gold. I have a small position in cash right now, just because I think, you know, uh, we're not going to get any hyperinflation yet. And that won't come. The risk of that wouldn't come until after the asset bubble bust and then the Fed's huge liquidity injection that follows it. So I have an ample amount of time uh, between here and there to, to find other investments. And actually in a hyperinflationary environment, uh, stocks would do very well. You know, I don't think mm -hmm. anyone lost a penny during the Weimar Republic being invested in the German stock market. So, um, but you want to obviously avoid the, the crash that precedes that. So the, wow. being nimble, but I think right now, you know, having hard assets and cash and just sitting back on the sidelines for me feels like the most comfortable thing, because in addition to what we're talking about with the economy, uh, and the risks there, um, there's a whole political uncertainty yeah. on top of it. And then the geopolitical risk as well. Um, so there's just so many moving parts right now um, and cross currents. And I think I just feel, you know, I sleep a lot better at night just having all my money, um, you know, buried in the ground. <laughs>
It's time for a quick break to hear these messages from my partners who make this podcast possible. Next up, Speed Bitcoin Lightning Wallet, one of the fastest growing wallets out there. Speed is a secure, low cost way to send or receive Bitcoin instantly. It's super simple and scores high user ratings. You can even use it to shop gift cards of your favorite brands and earn rewards. Download Speed using the QR code on the screen or the link in my show notes and use promo code COINSTORIES10 to get 5,000 free sats. Next up, CoinKite. CoinKite makes everything you need to safely self-custody your Bitcoin, including the cold card wallet. That's the cold storage device I use for safekeeping my Bitcoin. You can verify the source code, it's ultra secure, and it's easy to use even if you're a beginner. Head to their site in my show notes and get a 5% discount with promo code COINSTORIES. And finally, the why of Bitcoin is easy to grasp, but the how can be so confusing. The Bitcoin Way is a professional Bitcoin IT and security team offering personalized one-on-one support that guides you through cold storage, setting up nodes, inheritance planning, privacy best practices, and more. Don't take my word for it. Take 82-year-old customer bills. Give the Bitcoin way a try. You will be well on your way to owning and protecting the greatest money ever discovered. Set up your 30-minute free consultation today. All right, back to the show. Well, that makes sense. I mean, we talk on this show a lot about hard, scarce assets. Obviously, uh, my choice will be Bitcoin, so I do want to ask you your views on that. But a a lot of the points you raised are so interesting because we are at this inflection point. Um, I like how you said, like, kind of, the the waters are crossing. It feels like the fourth turning. Um, maybe things will be different, but I, I believe that they're just going to come in and print. And so on a nominal yeah. basis, things like stocks always do well. And I saw that you you wrote back in 2012 an article um, about the end of fiat money. And a lot of people have been talking about this for a while, right? The move yeah. to de-dollarization, the fact that we've printed too much. But yet, to our earlier point, we just keep kind of kicking the can down the road. And it seems like timing is really important because people that did invest in things like gold or held cash, they were losers compared to the people that invested in these tech plays and the stock indices that have just outperformed in most years. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because it seems like, you know, for people who remember the movie, The Big Short, it's like you're waiting, you're waiting, and you could lose a lot of money waiting for the thing to actually pop for you to be right. and, And you have to time it correctly. So how do you... Um, you know, why do you, why do you choose not to be in stocks when clearly those have outperformed the last decade? Well, um, so it all depends, of course, where you start dating it. Um, and I get a lot of, you won't be surprised, a lot of, um, let's say snide comments about having missed the move in stocks because I've been so, um, focused on gold and hard assets for a long time because I've been watching this federal reserve lather, rinse, repeat, Uh, dollar debasing behavior. Um, If you go back 20 years, which is really when I started Macro Mavens and and began talking about the housing bubble bust. And at the time Mm -hmm. I said, you know, when they to pursue this unconventional policy, which I knew they would start printing money to numb the pain of the housing bubble bust, that will start as a discretionary economic policy, but it will end up as a deficit financing necessity. In other words, QE won't be a one-time thing it will be forever. Um, And so I, from then on, have basically been out of the stock market and owned gold over that 20 period, 20 year stretch. Gold and the S&P have performed pretty much the same. Um, In fact, gold nominally is up 500% and the S&P is up 400, not including dividends. So if you've been invested in the right stocks and gotten the dividends, you've, you've done better. Um, but on that, you know, I don't feel like I've missed out on anything, but again, it depends on when you date it. You know, if you date it in the last five years, yes, I've missed out on all of the tech Tesla and video, all that Mm -hmm. great stuff. Um, but I sleep really well at night and I don't have to worry about timing because I don't have to worry about getting out before the crash comes, you know, because Mm -hmm. these people presumably haven't sold yet. They are enjoying the ride. We'll see if they have like a Hillary Clinton uh, perfect timing situation or Nancy Pelosi, who's able to time every, you know, tick um, just perfectly. (laughs) Um, I don't know. The average investor probably isn't going to be that lucky. Um, But so, yeah, I guess I get a lot of pushback on that, but I, I have no problem with it because I feel like, you know, I've, preserve my sanity and I don't have to worry about timing and and those people 
if they ride the downturn are um, going to feel a little silly having pointed the finger at me. So, <laughs> Right. And, and a lot of people will pile in because of FOMO right before that crash. Um, right. And so you, along with many analysts that I, I, talk, I talk with, they are predicting that at some point we're going to go off this cliff and it is going to be painful. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin because of for me, that is the solution mm -hmm. to a lot of these issues that we're talking about. And it sort of pierces right at the heart, at the manipulation, yeah. at the core of central banking policy. And um, I, I was wondering, what what is your take on it? What do you feel about Bitcoin? Well, I would start by saying that the reasons why you and people who are involved in Bitcoin like it are the same reasons that I like gold. So I think our macro rationale for being in it is the same. And therefore, I'm very sympathetic to that. Um, I, maybe it's a generational thing cause I am much older, um, that to me, gold has been around for centuries. It's always been money. Um, and I can touch it and I can feel it. And to me at my advanced age, being able to hold it and snuggle up and have it in my vault or in the ground or whatever <laughs> makes me feel more comfortable than having it be in some, you know, digits out on the cloud or wherever, you know, this is how obtuse I am about the technology, but it just doesn't, you know, from a personal standpoint, for me, that doesn't give me the warm and fuzzies that knowing that I can touch it and feel it does. Um, but the really bigger issue for me um, isn't, you know, I, I believe firmly that cryptocurrencies aren't going away. They're going to be here and they're, they're definitely going to, let's say, gain share versus other forms of money in the future. So I'm not trying to fight the future. I mean, change comes and, you know, I'm not like a Luddite who's going to say, oh no, they're going to cease to exist and gold's the only thing. Um, my real reservation around it has been that no government is going to voluntarily give up control over money. So if and when Bitcoin or whichever Currency, you know, cryptocurrency emerges as the winner. I presume everyone in the space is, just, you know, waiting for one to emerge as the cryptocurrency. I don't know, but this would be my sense is that there has to be one uh, or two, let's say. Um, and at that point, if it becomes money where people are actually transacting in it rather than just holding it as an investment. Um, regulators are going to really come in and that regulatory regulatory boot will come down and eliminate several of the things that I think Bitcoiners, from my understanding, view as the part of the allure, like the anonymity of having Bitcoin, letting it, you know, having it be off the, the grid, let's say, uh, away from the long arm of the government. Um, I just don't see that that is sustainable if Bitcoin or the other currencies become really where everyone hopes that they go eventually, if they become big enough and uh, transacted enough. Um, in a way, I've always said that their success sows the seeds of their failure, and maybe failure isn't the word, but the more they succeed at what they're hoping to do, the sooner the regulatory boot will come down. So that's sort of in my central hesitation about it, but I in no way mean to suggest that they aren't going to persist in the future and have a larger role and take a larger share of the way we transact, um, you know, away from things like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure many decades ago, people thought, well, credit cards, you yeah. know, I'd rather use cash. And now you go to buy a $3 coffee and no one's using cash. They're using their credit card. So I see this is clearly just another leg forward and advancement, um, you know, progress in terms of digitization and, and moving forward in that regard. But I, again, my hesitation is around what it means from the regulatory standpoint. Um, and then also, how do you value that? Um, why should these cryptocurrencies trade at a premium to other forms of money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's all, you know, probably a topic for another day. And it's also, I would say, impossible to quantify right now how, how one should value uh, these currencies. 
but I'd be really interested to hear you tell me how you how you would value them if that's well I I understand your concerns. It's funny when you bring up the the credit card um, story because I remember actually it was like a news package that someone resurfaced when credit cards were starting to come out. I think they did it at a it was a local news station. They were at a Burger King, and no one no one thought that credit yeah. cards would take off and that anyone would use them. And people loved cash, and things have right. changed so much. And obviously, the internet has changed the way that we communicate, the way that we do yeah. business. We order everything online. So I think you're right in the sense that things are moving to. Um, the, the digitization really of our economy and no one transacts in cash and the governments don't want us to have cash. But you actually, you bring up an interesting um, point and, and sort of debate that we have in the space about whether Bitcoin is a store of value or a currency. Mm -hmm. And most people say it's both, but obviously governments would have more of an issue with it being a currency mm -hmm. because they want to be able to surveil and tax. Mm -hmm. And so if you have something that's global, that's peer to peer, that they can't really trace, that's obviously a problem. Right. As for the store of value, we're seeing so much progress and legitimization on that front, everything from the ETFs to, I mean, a lot of people do see it as sort of a digital gold. And why would the government have a problem whether you store your wealth in right. Apple stock or Picasso paintings or Bitcoin? Right. But it is that transactional component that I think we're going to continue to see a lot of friction as governments come in wanting to be able to see and then extract through taxes as, as much as you know, they possibly can. <laughs> um, so I think that's, that's the battle that we're going to have. But as far as um, digital money, I think that it, it was only inevitable. And thank goodness that Bitcoin came around. That is the only de truly decentralized uh, protocol and blockchain, the one that is truly the most secure, that is backed by all this energy. And so I think it'll be an interesting next decade because we are seeing presidential candidates start to warm up yeah. to it, embrace it, possibly because they want to earn votes. But we still, like like you're kind of alluding to, we're going to have some regulatory hurdles um, because Bitcoiners might want it to be extremely private and, and a global currency and governments will want it to be more of a store of value. So um, are you someone who's in the position of like, I'll wait and see, or, or would you like invest a tiny bit in it? Or are you absolutely not? Like you don't want to touch it. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind investing in it. I just right now, the way it trades strikes me as trading more like a speculative asset. So unless I started to see that it was trading more one-to-one -one with gold, which is clearly not traded as a speculative asset. It's it's <laughs> definitely not traded that way. Um, if it started to hew more co closely to that sort of trading pattern, then I would absolutely consider having a small position in it. I'd certainly prefer to have my money in gold. But again, you know, I'm not yeah. trying to ignore that this is the future, and I'm not anti-progress. Um, but I do see those yeah. hurdles as um, you know forthcoming. Um, and we'll see how it plays out. And, and I think you're right, you know, uh, the political um, interest or, or lack of interest in it is going to be interesting going forward with different candidates, um, you know, uh, trying to uh, ingratiate themselves. And we'll see how that plays out. But I think um, you clearly can't ignore it. Uh, the, yeah. the cyber currencies aren't going away. Blockchain is clearly going to become a more widespread um, and important technology and the digitization of transactions is the future. Um, so again, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be a total Luddite, but um, I just don't see it yet. Uh, no, well, I I really yeah. appreciate your open mindedness because, like I said, I bring in people from all different backgrounds. I have you know Peter Schiff on several times, yeah. who's probably the villain of Bitcoin and <laughs> loves his gold. Uh, but no, I appre I appreciate how open you are to it because uh, a lot of people just it's it's so early and and a lot of people yeah. just haven't had the time. It takes it took me years to understand Bitcoin, and so I just appreciate you you saying that that there is a chance. Um, and, and I <laughs> you're saying I talk there's to people, a chance. Like you're saying there's Yes, I talk to people oh. like you all the time and I'm like, she's a Bitcoiner. She doesn't, doesn't really yeah. know it yet, but I think in the future you'll be <laughs> talking yeah, about no, Bitcoin. Again, I mean, it, my hesitation is that it trades so much like a speculative asset right yeah. now. Um, and I, as you can tell from everything I've said in our conversation yeah. thus far, I am steering as far away from uh, speculative assets as I possibly right. can. Um, right. But, you know, right. 
I'm not ruling anything out in the future. Well, as we start to wrap up, um, you know, I think a lot of people are seeing that they're just trying to rearrange decks on the Titanic yeah. and things are going down. Um, but I really want the average person to be empowered, to be able to uh, not only maintain their purchasing power, but hopefully to grow it, especially, you know, young people, Gen Z that's coming yeah. up and, and trying to hopefully have a house someday and, and achieve the American dream. So what's your, what's your biggest advice for the American working class when it comes to accumulating wealth and, and preserving it? Well, I'd say number one, work hard. You know, you're, it's not going to be handed to you. You're going to have to really bust ass, if I can say that, um, yeah. and find your space and what you're passionate about and just pursue that. But, you know, push hard because um, there's a lot of competition and success doesn't just come easy, although it may look like it for a lot of, you know, when you look at how much money certain people like, you know, you watch Mark Zuckerberg and Jeff Bezos and you think, oh, they had it so easy. But, you know, these people worked really hard. Um, so that would be number one. Number two, I think, would be to be very, you know, the harder you work for that dollar, the more determined you are to protect it. Um, and so I wouldn't get swept up in trends. So if you, just because someone, uh, your neighbor or your friend, uh, just made a killing in NVIDIA or whatever today, I, you know, if you don't feel it in your bones that that's appropriate for you, don't feel pressured to take chances with the money that you've worked so hard to earn. So I, you know, no one's gonna protect your assets the way you are. You know, you've got to really take care um, mm -hmm. and make smart decisions and don't feel compelled to follow the herd. I think that, you know, that's been a great lesson for me because most of the time the herd has it wrong. Um, so don't be afraid to think independently um, and follow your gut um, and, you know, just, be mindful of the risks out there and only risk what you feel like you can really afford to lose. Um, I guess th these are all, you know, probably trite observations, but I think they're really important and um, they're true. Yeah, very much so. And hard, scarce assets. I, I think it's great how much you focus on just helping people with financial literacy because it's crucial. It's crucial right yeah. now. And you can't just, you know, passively invest the way that you you could close your eyes and and hope for the S P to go up, which by the way, basically tracks the amount that they're inflating the right. massify. Exactly. Um, Overlay the Fed balance sheet with the S P. Yeah. But I you know, um, and I would also say like for me, know your limits. So for me, as I mentioned to you, I've I've pretty much owned gold and and very little in terms of paper assets since mm -hmm. I started my business 20 some odd years ago. And a large part of that is because I'm not day trading. I don't have the time yeah. or the appetite to sit here and try to game every squiggle in every stock um, that I'm interested in. So for me, it was just an easier way to just have my money in hard assets, sleep well at night and not have to stress about, do I need to sell today and buy back tomorrow or whatever? That was a personal decision. There may be other people who love that and that's really what they get excited to do. So it may be more appropriate for them to play that game. So just know your limits and do what's comfortable for you, but don't feel compelled because everyone else is doing one thing that that's the way to do it. Yeah, I agree. It makes me think of the casino that was the post pandemic stimulus and everyone in meme stocks and the cryptocurrencies that, you know, bounce right. one day and then, and then collapse the next. Um, yeah. So yeah, be, be careful with that. A slow and steady wins the race. Um, anything else that we didn't talk about that you wanted to just mention or talk about? Geez, not that I can think of. I think we covered pretty much the waterfront. I guess one thing, that we haven't talked about, um, and I'm sure your audience is very aware of, is that um, in addition to the election that we've got coming up before that, about three weeks before that, we have that BRICS Plus meeting in Russia that's going to take place. Um, and that, I guess, will have real repercussions for our respective mm -hmm. interests, gold and for cryptocurrencies, um, as the BRICS Plus nations are likely, we think, to announce real progress on a joint currency. Mm -hmm. So that's that's going to be very interesting um, to see, you know, what the comments there are and how currencies, especially the dollar, um, react to whatever announcement comes out of that. 
Oh, I will be watching that closely. We talk about de-dollarization in Brooks a lot on my show. We've got that. We've got the election. After the election, you're having an event in yes. Tampa. I think it's on November 14th or so. So where can people find you and what's that event? Okay, well, I pinned it on my Twitter. I'm at S Palm Boy, like Steph at S Palm Boy, P-O-M-B-O-Y on Twitter. So I've got that link to, it's called the Super Terrific Happy Day, which is based off of the podcast that I do with Grant Williams. Uh, called the Super Terrific Happy Hour. And we have a handful of people who have actually been guests on our podcast who are going to be presenting. We are going to have a really interesting, um, I think that the highlight will be a debate between Dave Ivan, who's a name many people will not be familiar with, but he has been a value, a classic uh, value investor for four decades now, probably the smartest person I have ever encountered in my career in Wall Street. Um, very smart. Uh, he's going to debate Kathy Wood on the definition of value because she's obviously uh. advanced sort of a new idea about the definition of value and, and the idea that we need to um, kind of readjust how we, how we uh, value different companies. So it's going to be extremely interesting, that debate between the two of them. Then we have, you know, we have a handful of really interesting folks. We have Peter Atwater, who's sort of a behavioral economist, for lack of another word. And he's going to talk about sentiment and uh, moods and how you can uh, anticipate swings in the market based on what you see in terms of popular mood. Very interesting stuff. Um, we have a guy who focuses on financials, who's going to probably talk a lot about what we're seeing in the corporate credit space, I would guess, in the consumer credit um, it's going to be a lot of fun. It's one day and it'll be topped off by a happy hour, which will be lively and, um, and hopefully very inebriated. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you're going to have a margarita. No, I'm super yeah. excited uh, for you. That sounds like an amazing event. I'll put the information in the show notes. Right. I'll be watching for that debate. Kathy Wood has been on the show. She's a big Bitcoiner, so hopefully she'll yeah. uh, she'll make mention of it. But Stephanie, it's been so nice to talk to you. Thank you so much. Again, Steph Pomboy, founder and president of Macro Mavens. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much, Natalie. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for checking out this episode of Coin Stories. If you're listening on the Fountain app, you can show your support and share your thoughts by sending a boost. One of last month's top episodes was with Jeff Booth. At Faison Hoddle boosted 2021 sats and said, Booth once again provides perspective to help see through the matrix and a hopeful path forward. The man is onto something and we need a thousand more that can communicate like him. I agree. I love reading and replying to your boost. So download Fountain on iOS or Android today and make sure you subscribe to Coin Stories. This show is for entertainment and educational purposes only. Nothing should constitute as official investment advice, and you should always do your own research. My inbox is open. If you want to share feedback or guest suggestions, just reach out at natalie at talkingbitcoin.com. Make sure you're subscribed to the show and check out my free newsletter, nataliebrunell.substack.com. I'll see you next time.